Greetings and welcome to the Department of Tangents podcast, a conversation with comedian Sue Costello with new music from Rebecca Turner. I'm your host, Nick Zeno. Sue Costello is someone I saw early on in Boston, specifically playing a show organized by Jimmy Tingle that featured Costello, Patrice O'Neill, and Steve Sweeney. She has always been tough, and she wears her Dorchester roots with pride. We got into some thorny topics here, including pervasive sexism in the entertainment industry and her dealings with CBS as the Les Moonves scandal was breaking. She has survived sexism in comedy and the television industry and come out of it trying to find a way to get people to communicate more productively, to get to a truth. As she says, the empaths need to grow some balls because the bullies are winning. That's part of the philosophy behind her new talk show pilot, Sima Down with Sue Costello. She wants people to be real about the ugly things in their lives and not be afraid to talk about them. The show is in pilot stage now, but it's up on YouTube and you can watch it on the blog at www.departmentoftangents.com. After the conversation, stick around for new music from Rebecca Turner. And now, Sue Costello. So uh, I do want to talk about positivity, but I want to start in Dorchester. Okay. Where you grew up. For people who don't know Dorchester, for people who aren't from Boston, what is Dorchester? Explain Dorchester to people. Dorchester is an Irish Catholic neighborhood, inner city neighborhood that gets confused for South Boston a lot. It's the next neighborhood over from South Boston. Mm-hmm. And it has, I and mean, used to be identified by your parish. Mm-hmm. That's how <laughs> people would know who you are. What parish are you from? Which mm-hmm. means what church? What what your parish was your Catholic uh, uh, section of? You know, if you were in this parish, this is you went to Saint. I went to Saint Lane, so mm-hmm. that's how they zoned it, I guess. Uh huh. And I, did that uh, contribute to you being a comedian? In it? Were you the, yes. the neighborhood cut up? I was. I would do the minstrel shows. We had tons of minstrel shows with uh, with. I guess it was in Saint William's School. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, they would have like a minstrel show for the parish, and I was always in them. And then I was in the band, Saint William's Band, and I used to put on shows in the band. And then, in eighth grade, I put on. Uh, we had a give. We were giving food to the homeless men at Pine Street Inn, and I was like, mm-hmm. "Why don't we put on a show for them?" Mm-hmm. And so I put a show together for them at Pine Street Inn, and we sang. Wait, how how old were you when you did that? Probably in seventh or eighth grade, maybe sixth. Did you did you realize who, who these people were? What what they yeah. what they were going through yeah. back back then? But that's who I was as a kid. I used to bring people home to my mother all the time and say, "Mom, you have to give them your shoes," <laughs> and she would give them to her. I was always like that as a kid. I used to work with um, with. Uh, with high functioning, I don't know what, I don't even know, because it was so, there was a variety of people, people that couldn't mentally take care of themselves. That's mm-hmm. how I would like to say it. Mm-hmm. They needed extra help taking care of themselves. And how did you, how did you approach humor with, with, uh, oh my God, did people? I laugh with them so much? <laughs> they were hilarious. Mm-hmm. I don't know what it is, and people always said it to me. It's my, my heart. I've always been, I always love people. Mm-hmm. And so I would work with them. I was 16 when I did that, and I would sleep over with them. Mm-hmm. And we would laugh because I would mess up all the time. Like one time I was popping popcorn for them. I didn't know what I was doing. Mm-hmm. I was only 16 years old and I was kind of winging it. Mm-hmm. And they needed people. This is in my play, part of my play. And they're like, you're high. And I'm like, oh, that's it? And then I'm like, oh, it's really hard to find people to work in. <laughs> <laughs> so were you, were you putting on shows for, for what, what did you do? I wasn't putting on shows with the, with the, it was called Bay Cove. It was a place that mm-hmm. took, had, they had homes all across the city where the people needed just extra, like really, they had needed living staff, but they were very high function. They would go to work, and mm-hmm. and so I would have to sleep over with them. I didn't put on shows necessarily, but I remember I had to give one of them a bath one time, Joan, and she was, oh my God, she <laughs> wanted to do her laundry every five seconds, so all day long, that's all she would do was talk about her laundry. Mm-hmm. And so when I gave, and I, I gave her a bath one time, and I remember putting her hair and like, uh, you know, making her look like a fish. <laughs> and we would laugh so hard. And then one time I was supposed to be making popcorn, and I and the popcorn came flying all over. I, I didn't know what I was doing, and they would scream laughing. They thought it was the funniest thing. So it was. it's like an energy thing. So I can even say that my energy has translated any judgments that people have 
<laughs> I've even had, like, I had, there's an Italian chef. My old boyfriend used to have a restaurant, and the guy was from Italy, and he didn't speak a lot of English, and I had him roaring laughing one night, and I remember thinking, it's an energy. This humor thing is an energy thing that I have. <laughs> and it, and it can, always comes from loving people. And it's... Well, it's odd. I think a lot of people w- would see like the cringe comedy now and say, "Well, does that come from from loving people?" Like, there's a lot of comedy that that seems, if you're trying to be edgy, it, you're not probably. It doesn't look like you're coming from a place of love. Well, I think that's a whole conversation that we could have about how the entertainment business created that, and that's only what was acceptable. And mm. I mean, I've. Comedy Central, I was going to do a special for them, but they they were like, we don't know what to do with Sue's energy. Uh-huh. And I was like, well, I didn't even know what they meant. And now I get it. Now I get what they meant. I don't do that. I don't, I've never done that on stage. I'm not. So the entertainment business, that's the Do you mean that, that they, wanted, they wanted something more negative or they wanted I, something that's more what edgy I would think, or more, yeah, sort more of? Just more clamped down. Mm-hmm. Not so bright. Uh-huh. That's really what it is. And that's what you're dealing with, the people who want something not so bright. Which is weird so. because people want bright. Mm-hmm. The people who are going to purchase the content, they do want bright. But there's something about the managing of the human race where keep, what does it say? If it, le- if it bleeds, it leads. Uh-huh. But do they want bright from comedy? I think a lot of people do. I, I, but I just I, but know I think from my the, experience, yes. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise they wouldn't scream and laugh at my shows. Mm-hmm. But the industry folks don't necessarily. No, and there's a naturalness to it that it's funny. As we were walking over here, we were talking about that idea of like how hard it is to be positive. Yeah, well, that yeah, that's something I, I want to definitely dig into here. How Did, hard it is to be positive and funny. I think it's. I like just keep going back to it being my energy. Mm-hmm. But, but I'm not mean. I remember doing Jim Brewer's comedy covers. And I was on stage and the girl in the front was so drunk and she was heckling me. And I let her have, like, I just let her heckle me. I didn't, I didn't need to kill. I didn't need to be hilarious. And I remember after the show, everybody coming up to me and saying, oh, my God, that was the kindest thing I've ever seen. I didn't even know that existed. And then so then I learned. And then I was like, oh, if the people didn't want that, then they wouldn't have come up to me. Mm-hmm. But there's the, the idea that comedy generally needs a target. Yeah. Something. So, how do you target something? I don't target and, anything. And I make fun of myself. Uh huh. Well, you're you're your own target. But right. in in a positive way, not in a degrading way. Hmm. So what I do is, I guess it is original, and it used to frustrate me because I'd be like, "Well, why can't I be me?" Well, how did how did you? You've always had the, the sort of positivity, but you've but you've developed, you've evolved as a comedian. From yeah, because they told days. me they they clamped me down, and of course, in the early days, you listen because I don't know. Mm-hmm. The first time I ever went on stage, I went on a duck soup, and I dre- I looked like a boy when I was little. They called me Buford, and I went on stage with my glasses and overalls, <laughs> and talked about and literally was the character. And I remember Maria Falzoni; she just died. God bless her. She said, "Sue, there was no one, no one who walked on stage as vulnerable as you do." Mm-hmm. And so that idea of attacking the vulnerability started early on and that was uh, that first time was you were at umass and your friends had egged you on to do it right that yes was they told me I, and everybody always told me i should do stand-up and i was terrified to do it because you were starting uh when you started out you wanted to do to do theater i was in yeah i went to school for theater mm-hmm. and so i'm try i'm trained as an actress too which people don't know that they think that it's that i'm just a comedian people like but they love to put you in a box they think i'm just a chick comedian but i'm there's a lot more to me. And so I fought that my whole career. I fought that being boxed. So that's what they do. They put you in a box. They want to say, oh, you're this, or oh, you're that. Mm-hmm. Or I can't. A spirit is very free. They can't. And they, they want to commodify it. Do you find that the box that they want to put you in is a fairly consistent, there's a fairly consistent definition? To, yeah, they to always want to make it look. Because what I can do is I can be, I can be edgy, but it's always loving. Mm-hmm. What what would be an example of that in, in, in your act? Is something you talk about that you think is edgy and also well, like when cool. I did a, a deaf benefit at BB uh, King's. It was packed, packed, packed in New York City, mm-hmm. and I walked on stage, and it was mostly deaf people. And there was a signer on stage, 
you know, a hand, sign language interpreter. Mm-hmm. And I walked on stage, and the first thing I said is, all I got to say is, she better be fucking funny. Uh-huh. And the audience <laughs> went crazy. I mean, crazy, because that's what I do. I acknowledge it, I say it, but I'm doing it from a loving place. And then the girls in the front were talking. And I was like, excuse me, I can hear you. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards, the woman who ran the whole thing, she's like, Sue, I cannot tell you. I've never seen any thank you for treating us like human beings Mm -hmm. so it's that fine balance between being pitiful you're treating people pitiful i don't treat people pitiful either if you're Mm -hmm. deaf they say your other senses work better like i'm very pragmatic like that Uh uh-huh they the industry will interpret that to be irreverent Mm -hmm. that's how they want it to come out that i don't care about people well what what opportunities have been sort of dangled and and yanked away from you then because of that box that's oh uh, there was a little show on fox called costello <laughs> yes there was <laughs> <laughs> just being one of the youngest women to ever get on tv and no one ever recognizing that after the fact it's just that little box that could be one of them mm-hmm. and that ran for for one season no it ran um, for, for four episodes and it was preempted like six times you shot eight episodes we right? shot eight episodes and the funny thing is that the audience that night went absolutely wild wild the marines were hanging off the off the side when i went to change they were hanging off the side of the of the the um stands where the audience was and they were like we love you so they were freaking <laughs> out and what was, what happened was they felt the energy my energy on the live set mm-hmm. and they were reacting and that's how people always have reacted to me well the criticism of it was was that it was what, it was too crude, it was too blue-collar at the time? Which is so interesting because that brings us to now. Right. 20-something years later, the classism that everybody's <laughs> suffering from now is the, the split between the have and the have-nots is way bigger than it was back then. And I was talking about the disenfranchised white middle-class man on my show. Mm-hmm. But I didn't realize what I was doing. I didn't have a handle on what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting that that's... The particular criti- criticisms lobbed at that show are the things that people praised about Roseanne. Well, th- one of the things is my looks. They don't like that that I look the way I do and that I'm as smart as I am and that I can be funny and that mm-hmm. they don't like it. They find it it's a threatening I don't know what it is. I don't, don't try wanna... to figure it out from them. I just know that it has been clamped down, stopped. Mm tried to be crushed in every way from club owners to and it was a phenomenon for me I would be like why are people trying to hurt love mm-hmm. well, that, that brings in a, a whole other sort of conundrum if you're trying to be positive and people are being negative to Very. you and then I would pick up the negativity so my weakness was I would pick up the negativity so you would see me fight I fought with people sometimes because it was like a I didn't know what was going I would pick up the negativity because mm-hmm. I didn't understand what was happening. I didn't get, and I felt it in my gut what was happening, but I wasn't conscious enough to know what was going on. So in a way, that's what happens on a personal level with people. Mm-hmm. People will project their bad feelings onto other people. Mm-hmm. And if you're not strong, you'll pick it up and you'll act it out. And then nobody, it's that, that thing where they say, um, don't argue with a fool because from afar you can't tell who, who's who. Right. That's what I was doing. Well, that seems like what we're doing on now. a social and political yes. level all over the place. That's what everybody's now. doing. And so I've transcended it in my own human life. And so now the world is catching up to what I've been doing. And I caught up to what I've been doing. And now all of a sudden everybody's taking notice. <laughs> well, so you, you caught up to what you're doing. What yes. do you mean by that? I didn't realize what I was doing with Costello. And I didn't realize so that so the industry will exploit you. Mm-hmm. That is the way they, I mean, any artist. You can talk about musicians, you can talk about anybody. The, the the business model of the industry as it stands now and why it's so perverted and why it's so turning on its head now, why everything's changing is because they've squeezed, and the same thing's happening with the, uh, from a, so, so industry-wise is reflected in the political world because the white middle-class men, the working men, we're, we're very proud of being good workers. Mm-hmm. But in order to keep us to be good workers, you cannot take everything away from us. Mm-hmm. 
what they're doing is they're squeezing everybody so much that they're going to have nothing to lose and they're going to turn. And that's what's happening in the in entertainment industry, too. They're squeezing everybody so much. You have to give us enough at least to be asleep with the American dream <laughs> or else. Well, but how are they squeezing? What is the what is the, the from the entertainment world? So mm -hmm. now what's going on in the entertainment world? Normally, you'll have an agent and an, and an attorney to represent you, and they the way it's set up has been very exploitive. The entertainment attorneys would get 5%, so which mm -hmm. means, I don't want to get too complicated with describing this, but 5%, an entertainment attorney, a normal lawyer, you pay per hour. Mm -hmm. An entertainment attorney gets 5%. So if you go to an entertainment attorney and you bring a deal that you've already gotten on your own to them to just negotiate the points mm -hmm. which they're all in bed with each other anyway so it takes them like five minutes to do it and it's usually to the benefit of the attorney and, and the network in the studio or the uh the, the label it's not in in the best interest of the artist mm -hmm. and then so you, so you pay the attorney five percent in perpetuity meaning if i brought a deal to an attorney who i never met before i have to give him five percent of that deal if it turns into seinfeld mm -hmm. even if i fire him and that did that happen to you with Costello? That happened to me with Costello, yes. Did it happen to you after that? No. Or because you learned your lesson with Costello and you... Right, so I just negotiated my own TV deal with CBS with no agent, no attorney, no manager. Well, how do you do that? How do they... Well, the whole story is very fascinating because what happened was it, it's a perfect storm. So I already knew from Costello that I wanted to go back in and do it myself. My dad was a labor mediator. I negotiated pretty much Costello by myself anyways because I did everything my dad taught me. Mm -hmm. But I did have the agent and the manager. But I remember the agent and the manager and the attorney coming to me and saying they couldn't believe the deal I got because I, I negotiated it the way that my dad told me to. Mm -hmm. And so this time around, I was like, I'm not doing it that way. And since then, it's become even more exploitive. So the agencies are owned by uh, private equity firms now, mm -hmm. which means we're definitely a commodity now. Right. And I was like, no. I'm not doing that. Well, it's that same. It feels like the same thing that the like the Beatles ran into when they were, when they you know you offer somebody you offer them a, a recording contract and they're what 19 or 20 or 21 at that time and they'll just sign anything because it's their big break. And it seems like that maybe that hasn't changed as much as we think. It it's hasn't changed. changed even a tiny bit. Mm -hmm. But now it's now it's starting to implode on itself because the Writers Guild is now made all the writers fire their agents and now they're all in a big huge fight so but that so i negotiated my own contract with cbs while the les moonves story was going on behind the scenes mm -hmm. i went and met with les moonves in july 2017 i went for advice because he's been somebody who's he gave me my first two tv deals mm -hmm. and i knew that he had not been on the up and up with me career-wise back then so i kind of went back purposely i went back because i want and my whole career i've always wanted to do what the boys did. Mm -hmm. I didn't want a guy to give me a job. I wanted to be one of the guys. The person giving the job. I just wanted to be what... I wanted to have the same opportunities as the men. That's it. That's as simple as it is. Mm -hmm. And have your own enterprise. Your yes. Own. Yes. So when you walk into that room this time to negotiate... I didn't even know I was negotiating. I was going into get advice and next thing I know little did I know what was going on behind the scenes the man's always known I was talented mm -hmm. he knew what I was explaining to you this this energy mm -hmm. he knows that I have that and I emailed him and said will you meet with me I didn't know he had a Ronan Farrell story coming out that was going to say that he did all this stuff to women so I'm mm -hmm. walking into the lion's den but were you surprised by it when it came out I mean he's somebody who has He's been in your corner, but things haven't exactly gone your way because of it. Well, that's what happened once the article dropped, and once I saw what he did to me this time, it all added up. Mm -hmm. Just like my career is adding up for everybody now. Everybody, I mean, they've written articles about me, that, about me being in Southie, and they're like, why isn't Sue a biggest star? Why isn't Sue a big, why? And I had, this, and journalists now are coming to me, and they're like, Sue, I think it's because you're not like anybody else that anybody's ever seen before. Mm hmm and I'm like, yeah, I think that is it. And all it is is just like a whole person. <laughs> well, do you find people underestimate you a lot? But they so hear, underestimate me because they hear your your the the accent and the, and they think, oh, well, this is, you know, so, some neighborhood. And that's like exactly some, some townie or something. Yes, well, that's that's what Jeffrey Epstein did. He went in and found girls from the working class so that he could get because he knew they needed money. So that brings you to me meeting with less and I didn't have any money because I paid 35% of my income with Costello so I didn't have tons of money when Costello got canceled mm -hmm. and I lived and I took 20 years to rebuild my career because I did not want to do it the way it was done I 
it like sucked my soul. And I am working class. Mm -hmm. And I don't need, I am not Hollywood elite. So you couldn't buy my soul. You couldn't, I didn't want that. What did you, did you need to rebuild that much that it took 20 years? Did, did, yes, did that's Costello, how much the sexism, the yes. Sex, the sexism and the fallout from the show only coming. And if you don't want to do what they are telling you to do. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be negative. I didn't want to do, I didn't want to do what they were telling me to do. Mm -hmm. So I took tons of hits. Comedy Central told me they didn't know what to do with my energy. I wasn't going to turn negative so that I could get a Comedy Central special. Mm -hmm. So I took tremendous risks. I lost everything, and I created all my own stuff. I was like, if I want to do what the boys do, I can't cry about sexism. Mm -hmm. I knew the sexism existed when I started doing stand-up in Boston. I stood there, well, right? Because yeah, Boston was, has been notorious, especially when, when you were coming up, for not being terribly kind to its, its female comedians. Horrific. Uh -huh. And I remember thinking, I got to get out of here because if, if I'm going to make it. And then I, but I didn't know the level. I mean, even on Costello, I saw all the sexism. The way they treated me was horrific. Well, when you were, let's let's go back to to Boston when you started out. Who was in the scene when you started out? I just remember when we were just talking specifically. I remember so the guy, the headliners used to host, mm -hmm. and I remember Kevin Knox. He just died since then. Since then, I yeah. mean, he was a very funny man. But I remember he was, the comedy connection was up the street from Nick's. And uh, Ellen Claycorn was on Saturday Night Live. She was a woman of color. Mm -hmm. And on Saturday Night Live, and a woman, and she was, he she was like the draw. She was the headliner. He was the host, and she was the headliner. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, it was time to her, for her, her to be called up on stage, and he wasn't there. He just skipped he, out? Mm-hmm. And I remember in my body, I was like, oh, he did that because she's a woman. Mm -hmm. I had to bring her up. What, how, and was that the usual you would say in, in Boston? How, how, just it's still, just treat women horrifically. Like a lot of the women that I started out with, I don't even know where a lot of them are. I mean, and the, the women from Boston now are starting to get their props because the Me Too Times Up movement made way for. Mm -hmm. Thank God. Well, is like that what it, is that what it took, or do you feel like took. you were making progress in those those twenty years from Costello? To I was to making now. progress behind the scenes. They didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. They thought I was still. So when I come back twenty years later, they thought I was still Costello. Costello. Uh -huh. They <laughs> thought well, well, they they thought you were still the the uh, the comic from the show, and not. They thought I was still naive. Who you are now? Yes. Cause how do you develop? Uh, well, may, this might show my own naivete to That's ask right. this question, but how do you develop behind the scenes when you're doing comedy constantly in New York City? What do you mean, how do you divide? I'm how saying you, behind the scenes in terms of I wasn't on any TV or anything. I was right, really, okay, so I was doing my play. My play was a very big part of me going over my life story and seeing where I played my own part and how mm -hmm. I abandoned myself and how I would abdicate my power and how I would pick up the negativity and act it out and how many mm -hmm. times in, in comedy clubs where I would do it. It was very hard to look at. Because it, that's why women have a hard time looking at it because it's so painful. You're like, this is really painful. How am I gonna, how am I gonna get around this? Well, because it's it's most of most or all of well, not all, but most bookers are men. And so, did you were you feeling most flack from the the bookers or for from other comics or all of it? Or was it mostly? Well, mostly the booker. Yeah, the bookers get really mad. That you, they get mad. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to face it. And I remember going to one of my Wall Street guys. I was supposed to, I asked Bill Blumen right here in Boston if I could do my comedy special mm -hmm. that I was going to pay for. Mm -hmm. I'm from Boston. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how much, what do I have to do, Bill? What do I, and he says, it's going to be $9,000 a show. You can do two, sh you have to do two shows and it has to be on a Thursday and you can't sell any tickets because you won't. And you can't sell any tickets because you won't? Or what does that mean? What exactly. Look at your face right now. Uh -huh. That's the kind of stuff that would go on behind the scenes that no one ever saw happen to women, ever. Mm -hmm. And there's this feeling that I describe where it feels like somebody takes a knife and cuts it through your chest where you feel so powerless that, like somebody kicked you. Because mm -hmm. you know they're setting you up that, that it's impossible to even do business. Well, you said you had to get out of Boston. Was it any better in New York when you got to, to New York? No. Women still did one spot and the guys got four yeah. on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And has that, that gotten better? Mm, it's getting better with, since with the Me Too Times Up movement. It is. Thank God. Thank God those women came forward because it was a really big, big, big uproar that had to happen. And the guys did fall because of it. Thank God. Mm. I mean, I don't want all the guys to fall from now on, but that had to happen. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we talked a bit on the way up here about cancel culture as well mm-hmm. uh, and how you thought that was <laughs> possibly itself about to be canceled about how that we're moving on to something else. I feel like we're in a time of creation destruction and in terms of artistry this it the artists are going to get the power back and it's just a natural progression and the same thing with the working class I think the middle class is going to come back and I think artists are going to come back because you cannot exploit people so much it's just an energy thing you can't so the imbalance of power that's gone on with men and women it's not working anymore it's not even working for the men anymore well the the dynamic now it's you can get yourself out there without the traditional gatekeepers quite as much. I have no agent, no manager, no attorney, no nothing. And I met with Les Moves and I negotiated my own TV show, <laughs> my own sitcom deal. And then with unprecedented side letter that has protections for women that no one's ever gotten. And I just did a talk show pilot mm-hmm. that I produced myself. Everybody's tweeting about me. Everybody's paying attention to me, and I have no agent, no manager, no mm-hmm. nothing. It's purely from me and so my energy. The 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 social media sort of aspect of it does that help that you can present your own case? Yes, it's helping tremendously for me because people are finally starting to hear what I'm saying instead of it being funneled to a man through the net male narrative. Mm-hmm. But that all happened through the whole year with the uh, with the Les Moonves thing. So he was going down for the. Ronan Farrell thing and he thought he was going to use me to cover for him going down and he was underestimating they were all underestimating me the whole time they thought I was by myself that I was some girl from Dorchester I got them to sign a non-disclosure agreement there were 10 executives in the room Mm -hmm. and I got them to sign a non-disclosure agreement which is unheard of a non-disclosure they they wouldn't say take my idea oh yeah okay and then they tried to not sign it and then I showed up with more copies of it it's literally like a sitcom itself the way I handled it and they had and they signed it and then I negotiated my own deal with the head attorney of CBS Corporation. And w- w- what was the end result? So then that? I signed the deal. Mm-hmm. And then a couple of weeks later, Mark Marin, I was on the WTF with Mark Marin. Mm-hmm. And I had been on that while I was negotiating with CBS. So all this is going on behind the scenes. I have no idea. Mm-hmm. No idea that any Ronan Farrell articles coming out. And it was funny because they were like, no, there's no rush in the email. And then meanwhile, they sent me like an urgent overnight package to send the contract back. Uh-huh. <laughs> now, in hindsight, I look back. I'm like, oh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> but would you just think, oh, well, it's a big corporation. They, they'll do that anyways. They'll send me. An, you know, it's no big deal for them to send an overnight package. Well, it was me to get the contract back. It was urgent overnight, but I uh-huh. don't know if I noticed until after the fact. Uh-huh. And so then a couple weeks later, so then on the Thursday, I think it was July 26th, uh, uh, Marin dropped the WTF, and he edited it completely. Mm-hmm. Edited out all my negotiations, all how hard I worked, everything to make it sound like I loved less. Mm-hmm. So on that Thursday, I was already devastated that Mark did that to me. Mm-hmm. I had already done two, two WTFs before. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is, this is worse than it was back in, at Nick's with Ellen Claycorn. Now they're coming together to stop me. As if it was as if they were coming together to stop mm-hmm. me. I didn't know what was going on with Les yet, but I knew he. I knew he purposely because I went to Brendan, his producer, and said, "I you edited it," and he literally emailed me, and mm-hmm. he was like, "No, we didn't." And I was like, "Brendan, this is gaslighting. This is what women mean when they say gaslighting." I know what I said in that room, and not only that, Mark was very aggressive with me. I I did it in a hotel room with him, and he was mm-hmm. so aggressive with me. Mm-hmm. And I and I said to Brendan after that. I said, Brendan, you can't edit anything that was said in that interview. I go, he was, everything that was said was because he was so aggressive with me. Brendan said, we don't edit anything. And the day it dropped, I emailed him. I said, I guess you changed your mind about it. He said, Sue, we didn't edit anything. We never edit anything. I said, Brendan, you're gaslighting me. Well, what did you say that, that, uh, that got cut out? Like the, the stuff about how hard it was for me to negotiate, how they roughed me up, all sorts of stuff. Mm-hmm. They literally roughed you up? Literally roughed me up. Not just... No. Not negotiating. No. Literally. How do they literally rough you up? They pushed me out of the room when I pulled out the NDA and then like shamed me in, in the lobby with the trying to get me to sign their contract. Shoving it in my face, telling me, sign this contract, sign this contract. I'm from Dorchester. I was like, get that out of my fucking face. <laughs> right, well, that's part of why... That's part of why I wanted to start with Dorchester. It was so funny. And I think what I did the first time around is I thought I had to pretend that I wasn't from Dorchester. Because they do have a classism thing, so I I did it. I that was one of my own weaknesses that I regret. 
that you could pre- you could pretend you're not from Meaning from I forgot my toughness. I forgot my badassness. I forgot it because I thought you were supposed to be fancy or something. I didn't know. And that's what they love. They love when you get caught up in that. Well, right. But how does that work out? Do you do you soften your, your accent? No, that, no, no. I just you... didn't use my tough. I'm, t- I'm really tough. Mm-hmm. Like really tough. Like you cannot fuck with me at all. Uh-huh. Not even a tiny bit. Not even one little tiny bit. Not, not, and now after the CBS thing, not even nothing. So what do, what does it take to to make it now? What does it take? But to I, get so I want to finish telling. So, oh, the, okay, so I'm sorry, the, that's right because I'm sure people are going to be like, we, "You left off. We didn't know." So the Mark Maron thing ended, and the next day the Les Moonves article dropped. And what I and as soon as the Les Moon, so I was already upset that he edited it, and then the Les Moonves thing dropped to where he was attacking women, mm-hmm. and it all hit me what was going on. That they they did the deal with me thinking that I I was going to help save Les. Ah, so they thought that, that by giving you that deal, and that my it script. would be cover, that it would be... Yes, and he was going to get my script and use me and say, we got Sue Costello, this is her show, and they were going to do pretty much the same thing that they did with Costello with me. I guess I, I'd be questioning that as an effective tactic. Exactly. What, what, right. How, what would that... <laughs> Everybody says that, but God, I, they probably weren't thinking straight. You have to remember. But well, yeah, I'm just wondering what go, what's going through their, their mind that... Oh well, if if Sue has a show now, then all of these other things won't matter. Imagine though, but I was in the office with them by myself. Mm-hmm. So guess what I would do? If well, they got my script, then I would be forced to say what? I was in the office with Les, and he didn't do anything to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, but you can't. <laughs> all right. I'm I'm sorry that, that that I'm confused. Go ahead, be confused all you want. Go ahead. By this, not 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 doubting what you're saying. I'm just confused. But it's all right if you doubt the it. Go ahead. Logic of I know, but see, you'd rather doubt me. This is pure sexism, or or this is pure what goes on right here. What's going on with you? Mm-hmm. You'd rather doubt me than see that they could be that absurd. No, that, I'm I'm not doubting you. I'm just trying to figure out what they were trying. But to, it, why it's they would easier think it for would you work. to say Sue. Maybe Sue's not. It it just is. It's human mm. nature. People mm. don't want to see. That people can be that awful, and I'm here to tell people people can be that awful. We, I think it's a, it's hard to to parse something so absurd. It's almost like a Monty Python. It's sketch literally that, hilarious, that they, but it's also hilarious because what I did was I didn't let them do it to me. That's why it's funny. If I let them do it to me, no one would ever know. Right. I'm telling and you, pro- and it's happened to how many other? But the New York Times people. reporter was there. And this other guy who negotiates for all the news for their, their contracts, mm-hmm. literally belly laughing. They're like, what did you say, in Sue? What did you do? They're like, oh, my God, this is the funniest story I've ever heard in my entire life. They're like, you beat them by just being honest. I'm like, yes. And they're like, this is the funniest thing I've ever heard in my entire That's why it's taken people a little while to catch on because everybody was thinking sex. I'm like, no, it's not sex. Mm-hmm. I beat them at their own game business-wise. And so now they gave me the deal. I did negotiate. So, so the article was coming out. They didn't know I knew how to negotiate. They thought, oh, she's a dumb broad, 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 we'll just... And then when I started negotiating with them, the, the pressure of the article coming out, they had to give me what I was asking for. Mm-hmm. So now I have this unprecedented deal that they didn't honor, but I still have the deal, and I still have the story, and I still beat them, and that story is coming out now. Well, I think that's where we are now, is that, that a lot of these the, the stories, the behavior is so uh, of these people is so absurd... It's hard to process the the whole thing, but it, it thinks I think people are are. I don't know. Do you think that they didn't believe the stories because they seemed too far out? Not in not in your case, but I think in general. Who didn't believe the stories? That, that the that the general public. No, is, the general public believes everything. They believe that, but no, the general public completely, completely believes everything I'm saying. Mm-hmm. No, I'm, I'm not talking in, in your case. I'm talking about a broader spectrum of, of the me too cases the thing oh you're talking about sexual stuff about the, the yeah because uh, it's hard to process yes and, and and the uh the sexual harassment and, and just the the, the prejudice and i the still action. have guys coming to me and act, like trying to argue with me about women having equality i'm like they raped women 
Mm. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, it, even the press, when I was talking to the press, I'm like, one guy from the LA Times came to me. He's like, what are your accusations? What are your accusations? I said, I'm not talking to you about this. I said, I'm not. I'm sick of you guys over-sexualizing us. I have a mm. story where women beat men at, at business, and you're not telling it. I don't want to talk about this, he said. Mm. I said, I don't care. You came to me. This is what I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. He goes, all right, tell me your story. So I started telling him my story, and he tried to put words in my mouth. I said, stop mm -hmm. putting words in my mouth. He goes, I can't talk to you. So you do still have to. I, I can understand one point of it is that you do have to interrogate a story before you put it in the, in the press. So, but you can't. Let me figure that. You, you, you still have to ask the question. Right, but now we're going to get into a whole of the belly so, of the beast about the press. Right. If you want to go into that, we can go into that too. Sure, sure. Because yeah. the press has been, same thing has happened with the press. Mm -hmm. The press has been turned away from their integrity like crazy, and that's why Donald Trump can say fake press, because there is truth to it. Mm -hmm. Do you mean the, the, the press in general? They're just the, looking the for, that guy was trying to reframe it. I, you're saying that you have to interrogate it. What does that mean? Well, you have to, if, if you're going to put a story out, uh, if somebody tells you a story, you still have to, to do your sort of, I didn't even tell him the story yet, though. Uh -huh. Okay. He was interrogating it before. Yes. You told him. Yes. This, told him. This was, and this, you, this is an L.A. Times yes. reporter. Yes. That, that you're and talking. so what's going on with them all is because I stopped doing whatever, whatever they do to people, mm -hmm. because I'm from Dorchester and <laughs> I stopped doing it. Right. They are, they're waking up to their own behavior. Mm-hmm. To the fact that they're not believing the, these... No, that they're the being stories. gross. Wait, uh, the, the media or the... The media. The, okay. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Everybody's waking. Because they're like, what? Even CBS, they're like, oh, no. They didn't even... That's how they do everything. Mm -hmm. And then I was just like, no, I'm not going to do that. And they're like, uh-oh. <laughs> uh-oh. Because they're used to everybody just folding. And think about it, if I don't do it, and everybody they did it to was going to put two and two together and be like, oh, that's what they did to me. But that was that was their whole plan. Their only <laughs> their only <laughs> their only. Plan yes, because after the fact, wouldn't they have just done my show? And what did they tell you at that point? They told me to send my script to the attorney. After so. So at this point, they've told you, you you've got the show. They told me to send my script to the attorney. That's after the after the negotiations. They after the less story came out, and before the less story, it seemed like it seemed like it was a go, and now it's more hesitant after the less story comes out. Nope. Now you're putting words in my mouth and see what you're doing. You're twi You're saying, no. I'm trying to figure out what the what the next thing is. I'm trying. But to you figure could out just the ask I, me. That's what I. That's what I'm trying but to. But the you. way you did that was you were putting words in my mouth and to to lead the story. So that's what the press has to be very careful of. Okay. Well, let, let's go back. Okay. So, so you had the meeting with Les Moonves. Yes. And then there was another meeting with, with attorneys. Is that the way it ha happened? Or was the meeting nope. was with Les I had Les the meeting Moonves? with Les. Then I met with the executives to pitch the show. Okay. Then I got the deal. Then the article came out. And then they said, send the script to the attorneys. What was the status of the show when you met with the, the attorneys? I never met with any attorneys. Or met with the executives. I was pitching my show to them. You were pitching it, and, they, and then they had you... And then I got a deal. That's how it goes. Okay. And then you then send the script yes. to the Yes. But what would happen was... That, no, you don't send your script to attorneys. No, but then that's what they <laughs> ask you to do, right? Yeah. No, not in real... Not in real not when you're really doing a TV show, no. Well, you no, but that, but that is... But is that what they ask you to do? After the last story right, came out, right. they started acting crazy. And said, because they realized that I didn't do what they thought I was going to do. Mm -hmm. That's what went on. And the way I was able to do that is because I know how to negotiate. And I sat still for two months to see what happened. Because my head, I was like, what the hell's going on here? So you sat still after they asked you to... No, I sat still after the less story came out to see what happened. And, but after the less story, that's when they asked you to send the script? Yes, to the attorneys. And you do, and that's when you sort of sat on it to see what happened. That's no, that's it. I sat on it before they. Before that. Before they told me to send the script, I waited two months to see how everything shook out, and then all of a sudden, all the stories came out about how he hurt women's careers, mm -hmm. how he hijacked people's careers, how he, and then another story came out, and then he got fired, and there, they were ta stories about how women were treated, and then they were doing the the internal investigation about all the sexual harassment, and then CBS came out about how they were treating women, and it was like a big disgusting 
sexual harassment gross mm-hmm. bed of iniquity. Uh, so and so I was like, well, hold the phone. <laughs> what, are, what are your thoughts as all, these things, as all these things are coming out? Disgusting, gross, 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 gross. And they negotiated in bad faith with me. They knew all this was going on. And I'm a woman and I just built, rebuilt my career. And I'm not going to go do anything that they think I'm going to do. I'm a woman and I'm standing with women. And I would never go against women ever, ever, ever. I would never take dirty money. I would never go against my own best interest. And mm-hmm. all I needed was development people. That's how you do a show. Mm-hmm. You send your script to the development people, and then the development people give you your notes, and then they give, you give them the back the script, and then you decide. Then they decide whether they're going to do the show. So, based on the fact that they were for not only that, but before the article came out, I caught the attorney trying to flub me up on the on my deal, and mm-hmm. that's what the New York Times, one of the New York Times journalists said to me. He goes, "Sue, they tried to flub you up on a deal that you negotiated for yourself." I'm like, "Yes, yes, they did," mm-hmm. and that's when my gut told me, "Sue, wait a minute." Just sit still for a second. And then the less article came out. So that was his. They were in. They must have been in complete and total chaos mode. That's why That's why it sounds weird that they behaved the way they did. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm not, uh, yeah the, the behavior itself is, is what's hard to, to process. But why is it hard to process? Harvey Weinstein was having women go to hotel rooms and having his girls take them there. I just don't know why someone would act like that i know so but they do the that, but that they do because it. it's and it's well this is well, this is probably going to sound naive as well it's not necessary it's not to act that right way. it's not that's what's so hard to swallow that's what's not, so hard that is that is what's so hard what is it that they wanted to get out of this behavior power but the power is what caused the behavior i would think the power is what causes the behavior. You're exactly right. So the power, the imbalance mm-hmm. of power is what causes them to spin out of control to start acting because they need more, 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 more. Yes. And the behavior is, is feeding that like an, like an addict. Like a, Absolutely a, like an addict. So I wrote an op-ed that I pat- sent out initially, and that was what it was. It was like giving up that addiction, my addiction, because you have to be a co-addict in order to be within a, mm-hmm. with, in an addiction. So I would have had to been a co-addict with less. I would have had to been like, okay, you can use me as a drug. What was the the very end of of that then with with CBS? So for a year, I tried to get them to give me development people. Mm-hmm. I begged them to act in good faith with me. I begged them, and I was under under uh, confidentiality too. So I was like, I can't even tell anybody. They literally trapped me like an animal, mm-hmm. and it all made sense to me because the articles were coming out. I'm like, oh, this. And not only that, Ileana Douglas was the person who pr- prompted the. Um, prompted the article about less. She went to Ronan Farrow once the Harvey Weinstein story came out. Mm-hmm. So flashback 20 years before that, I'm on the set of Salty with Rose McGowan, and Rose McGowan tells me the story about what happened to her with Harvey Weinstein mm-hmm. six months later after he had... Six months after... The, after. the incident mm-hmm. with Rose. I was on the set of Salty. She tells me about it. I leave there, and, I, and uh, I'm supposed to be on Murphy Brown for 13 episodes, and I get fired after two days. Mm-hmm. I have no idea why. I picked Murphy Brown because I figured that was the best move to learn from somebody who was very talented Mm -hmm. and grow my presence. And then if I was going to do it, it was a very humble move. And so I got fired out of nowhere and I didn't know why. And then I got a call at midnight that I should go fly to L.A. because Ileana Douglas just got fired. So now here we are, 20-something years later. I went back to Les Moonves because I knew I was going to confront my past. Mm -hmm. The article drops and everything hits me. I'm the one that took over for Ileana when she when he she said that he assaulted her and fired her because he assaulted her. And you had just heard Rose McGowan tell her. But story. now, so now and then the Harvey thing comes out, and I knew I had to, I had heard Rose twenty years before too. So I'm like, I'm I've been in the middle of this woman's movement for twenty years. I didn't even know I was. Uh-huh. And they were trying to use you back then as cover. Less used me to cover for Ileana. Mm-hmm. But you had already known the, the Rose McGowan story. I knew the Rose McGowan story, so then the Harvey story drops, and I know it's true because I know I was mm. there with Rose. Rose told it to me in, pers- in private, not for any no, uh, motive. Uh, did, you, did you think about what uh, McGowan had told you yes. uh, when you were replacing Ileana Douglas? Or did it not? No, not none of that. No, 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 no. No, it didn't, aff- it didn't connect at all. Because I never had any sexual stuff. Les never gave me any of that. Mm-hmm. Probably because I'm from Dorchester. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, this might be a stupid question as, as well, but have you talked to 
him since all of this happened? I tried. No response. Okay. I know exactly what was going on, which is interesting, which brings us to the Shane thing that happened with SNL. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was just watching uh, Chris DiStefano and um, Giannis. They have a, a podcast, and Chris was saying that he thinks that Lauren Michaels knew that Shane had done spoken those words and hired him because he knew the backlash was going to happen and get them a lot of press. I'm not sure that that's all positive press for him, though. For who? For for Lauren Michaels, all this this. Stuff. But you have very yes. You we need to wake because, you up a little bit, well, Nick. No, because it's, because <laughs> but well, that's the, with the culture we live in now. But because what I'm hearing about this is uh, from people. Mostly from people who were offended by the the comments, but it's, did this guy not do any due diligence on his on okay. who he was hiring? Okay, okay. So all? now I'm going to tell you to sit still. Okay. That question that comes up because of your naivete, because you don't want to believe that the world is the way it is, mm -hmm. that's the reason why there's no positivity. Because people are in denial that the bad stuff happens. If we really, really saw the bad stuff, we would be able to stand up to him and be much more positive. Because they wouldn't mm -hmm. win. There's only a few bad apples but they're winning because we're all like no that mm -hmm. can't happen why would they do this so unnecessary why would they do that la, la, la. it's like they're doing it let's let's deal with it but in this case do we know that lauren michaels knew this i didn't say that you mm -hmm. said the question was that the person said to you didn't he do his due dil diligence so when your logic right. comes in and you start asking questions like that then you take it a step further and mm -hmm. that's when you start seeing what the machine does mm -hmm. Well, I'm just, I'm just talking about this case in specific because you said that on the DiStefano's podcast, they had said that he had probably seen this stuff and hired him so for the, the, the press that would, that would follow from the, the firing. And doesn't Which, that match up with what you said that everybody's saying? Why didn't he do his due diligence? Yeah, well, well, I've heard other people say about this, other comedians and people who were uh, offended by by the comments that they wondered if he had why would he hire the guy if he hadn't if he had seen those and didn't he do so that's not terrible that's not a terribly positive outcome for michaels yes it the, is, for, for so. people questioning his judgment he doesn't his, they don't uh, care hmm. well, but the people who are saying didn't he do his due diligence are now looking he doesn't on care. that show. He, he might not, but the people who are saying that, it's not a positive thing to them. But that's how our whole culture is right now, Nick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. No, that's what we... And then now that brings us full circle to why it's hard to be positive. Mm -hmm. Okay, because... And that people do want positivity, because mm -hmm. you do want it. But yeah. there's something about this thing that goes on with the narcissist and the empaths that needs to stop. Mm -hmm. These narcissistic bullies are the ones that are winning, mm -hmm. and there's only a few of them. And the rest of the world with the empaths, and same thing as the working class, they take advantage of our goodness, and we allow it. Mm, the narcissists do? We allow it. Because mm -hmm. if we didn't allow it, they wouldn't be able to do it. Mm -hmm. That we allow the uh, bullies to... Because there is a sense of, like, we don't want to be like them. And mm -hmm. I do think that nobody showed us a different way. And mm -hmm. I've said this one in my talk show pilot, even since 9-11. I feel like 9-11 crushed the fantasy that mm -hmm. we were that impervious that nobody could ever hurt us that we were in la la land america and that 9 11 happened and i think since then people they don't have any other way they they know i think people are totally dis disillusioned by the american dream about get two cars and get this and i mean they really ran people into the ground i think we're having a problem trying to figure out what we can do yes to fight back it's because, as you said, you don't want to. I think that the people who want positivity don't want to. Uh, and it occurs to me I keep pronouncing that with a D. Positivity, <laughs> not top positivity. That's okay. As um, long as you're saying it, who cares how you say it? <laughs> no, it's it's funny. I'll, um, I'll get back to back on track for a minute. But doing this podcast, hearing my own voice uh, every week now is is another cringeworthy sort of oh, thing. Oh, so I know. Think that, oh, man. You have to not even do, do it. But, but uh, uh, to get back to the point about how do you fight a, a bully, 
And most people would say that you've got to be a bigger bully. Or no. A lot of people say that. you got to do what I did. Oh, so my deal, problem. I let my deal expire. Mm -hmm. I okay. let it expire. Oh, right, right, right. I let it expire. And they knew. They knew I had no money. Les Moonves knew I had no money. They thought because I was broke that I would take the money. Mm -hmm. That I would co-sign what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And they tried for an entire year to intimidate me to try to get do that. And the day the deal expired, I thought I was going to die. I literally, I had to sell my clothes from Costello to make my rent. Mm -hmm. And that kind of blind faith, that kind of discomfort, that kind of holding on to yourself is what we empaths need to do. Mm. Well, there's the temptation a lot of people would have just taken some kind of deal to, to pay their rent. It, not only to pay the rent, what I'm really seeing is that we do it because we want some something for the abuse. Mm-hmm. That's really what it is. It's something in exchange for the... Yeah, because imagine that. I, I went through all of this. I'm going to get something. <laughs> I jacked my whole thing. career. Uh -huh. I couldn't even work with anybody else. And they were torturing me for a year afterwards. Just torturing me, torturing me, torturing me. What trying to screw up my brain. Trying to make me not think that... Trying to mess with my brain. Trying to send me to the investigators. Trying to do anything they could do to get me to do what they wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. Anything. What were the communications? But was it emails or phone emails? Calls? I have all the emails. That's what's so crazy. But they never thought I was going to walk away from the money. Mm -hmm. So what? Did, well, let's hmm, should we go back to the positivity? Well, back to the or, empaths. Or we back to, to the, the empaths starting to get balls. Like mm -hmm. that's what that's what it is. It's like, and that's where the positivity comes from. Dealing with reality, because otherwise we just keep shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, and that's not working. And there's there's way more of us than there are of them. But the thing, the the comment about empaths getting balls. What does that look like? That's the, I think that's the question. And it, it looks like what what I'm talking about about saying no mm -hmm. and holding your ground. Mm -hmm. And it is sacrifice, and it is painful, and you do want to... So, it, so it's this idea of not attacking back when attacked. It is, trust me, it's not for the faint of heart, but what mm. else are we doing right now? Right. I feel like we're, we're, people are going to... We have it in us. I do. I believe we... T we're these, all of us, we work really hard. We're proud of being good people. We want to we give. We don't want to be taken advantage of. We have the strength in us. We, we absolutely do to hold our ground. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're squeezing us so much that we don't have enough money anyways now. People are going to do it. They're mm -hmm. going to find a resolve inside themselves that they're going to stand up in a way that they're going to come together and stand up in a way that they could never have transcended unless the world turned into the way it's turned into right now. Mm -hmm. I, I, have, I knew it last year. I knew it the year before. I said it on my WTF. Now I'm even more resolved to it now. So now that brings us to the, the talk show because it's a different kind of talk show. What is the... How would you... How would you explain what the, the talk show what is? What do you mean different type of talk show as opposed to? Well, it's not your your standard sort of monologue and, and guest and variety show sort of thing. There's more, there's something more pointed about it. Yeah, I, I'm interested to see how you received it. Did you watch it? I've, I've watched, I've only watched half of it at this, at this point, but it, it's... You're talking about so, something more substantive uh, on the show. It's not just people coming in. Uh, the first one, the pilot's up on YouTube now. People can watch it. It's uh, Mike Britt, John Fish, and... and Roberto Vanderpool, and it's called Simmer Down. Right, <laughs> right. Simmer Down with Sue Costello. So, yeah, the show is about all my work like my friend was in the audience that day and he's been in the business forever and he's like Sue I was watching you and he's like all all roads of 30 years of Sue's career has led her to this moment mm -hmm. right here so yes it's about um, it's about what I'm talking about right now it's about how do we how do we find that pause in between mm -hmm. and it's really it does I'm not it's easy to fight it's very hard not to fight. I mean, and if you think about it, this is what Martin Luther King was talking about. Martin mm -hmm. Luther King, John Lennon has talked about nonviolence and humor being the most powerful tools. Well, you talked about, uh, in the sort of opening part, you talked about people finding you re repulsive and this show being your, <laughs> your answer <laughs> to whether, you, whether or not this is where you're going to prove. Whether I'm repulsive or not. I just was being funny with that. Because, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. But right? It's, but it's a, but that's that's part of that's taking a, a bully's criticism. Yes. 
of of saying somebody saying that they find you repulsive right which is very dramatic and like what do you, okay come on right it's a dramatic like yeah it, uh, well it's 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 that's a, a a critic's problem frequently that something has to be taken i don't, I, I think a, a lot of critics don't want to say this was okay this right was not, so it has it to, has be, to yes. be this was terrible this yes. was the worst thing in the world and it, it which brings us to that press thing that i said that the now the press because i don't i know journalists they're not happy they're they're so unhappy mm-hmm. because they're being squeezed too they have to do the clickbait they have to do the story they have to do their twitter da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. And so no one's having their integrity that they wish that they had inside of themselves mm-hmm. and we're blaming everybody else but who's doing it mm-hmm. we're doing it we're the ones acting. We're, we're responsible for our own behavior, regardless of what you. But the, but this your show is your way of, of positively addressing the negative. Well, my show is kind of bringing it into reality, like, and being just like taking the drama. Like I'm trying to like, because I don't even know if the drama is even real. Like I don't even know how much of what is going on in the world is even real. Mm. If people really feel this way or not, or if they really just. If it's just all hype. Well, that's a, I think that's a big question of like right? where people would feel lost now as well. Because I think that there was, there was this sort of philosophical idea of, well, nothing's ever really black and white. Exactly. And that's a good thing to a point. But then that can be twisted into believing that... that there is nothing that is there is no truth there is no black and white to anything and that's where you leave somebody that's in where a everybody gets position. terrified yes yeah because they they don't know <clears throat> that's where fake news comes comes in as well you call something fake news <clears throat> and people there's an there's people have seen something enough to to you mentioned this earlier to to uh to validate that mistrust, whether it was whether it was an, an all-out lie that somebody put in print, or it was just a spelling mistake, it's whatever whatever hits that particular person. Right. So to speak to that, yes, that is what my show is. My show is kind of like I'm going to be a live action. Let's see what truth is. Uh huh. Because I believe there is a universal truth, and when people feel it. And they felt it in the audience that day. There was nothing like what happened in that room that day. And mm-hmm. what I'm doing is I'm setting up this show in a way, so yeah, to speak to you, what is truth? And nothing is black and white, and everybody interprets things through their own trauma, through their own experience, through the way they experience the world. Yeah, so how do we find s- some common ground here? The show is me, and I also have rules on the show. Mm-hmm. I have a whistle. <laughs> if they step over the lines, I blow the whistle. And it was funny, because John Fish said, what are the rules? Uh-huh. Nobody knows what the rules are now, and we do respond to rules. And rules should be, they should be rules, and they should be flexible. You, they shouldn't be rigid. So in that sense, like, how do you do that? And it is up to the individual. Like, what is acceptable to me isn't acceptable to other people. And we try to gl- clump everybody together and say, this is what's acceptable to people, and this isn't, and that's where you have a problem. So what I'm doing with the show is, okay, so it's me interviewing three men. Mm-hmm. So right away already I'm putting myself at the disadvantage because it's three male comics. Who has the guts to do that, right? Uh-huh. And then, um, so it's me and the guys talking, and I have the whistle. <laughs> and I'm in charge, because I'm changing the, I'm the woman, I'm in charge now. I'm going to change the power dynamic by, mm-hmm. have, by being the boss. But, so then the live audience is there, and they're watching us. And they know the rules. So now I'm engaging everybody, because they're watching me. And I've wa- had people watch me. So you say, talk about the pessimism. I've had people watch me. Sue's not that good. Mm-hmm. I bet you Sue's shady. The thing with CBS, they could not get me because I don't have anything shady. I never mm-hmm. slept with anybody. I didn't take the money. And mm-hmm. not taking the money proves to everybody, makes people feel so safe because they're like, Sue didn't take the money. Mm-hmm. Sue's somebody that I can feel safe around because she was broke and she did not take money. So that's something real. Mm-hmm. So now on the TV show, so the audience is watching us. Now they're watching me talk to the guys. There might be moments where I screw up. Mm-hmm. So then the audience is going to call me out. Uh. So they have that view. And then the people at home are going to be watching it. And they're going to have a bird's eye view. So if the audience says something to me and they're wrong, then the audience at home has even a better bird's eye view. Mm-hmm. So they can call us all out on. Is, is there it's a like way a, going forward that you, you can incorporate the people watching at home and their yes, reaction? Yes, I want to do phone calls and I want to do uh, interactive 
online things because I want to see. It's actually literally like what I said. It's like a think tank. Like I want to see if we can transcend our own selves mm -hmm. with this TV show, and I'm me included. Because mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be moments where I'm talking and I'm full of baloney and I'm saying. I believe that I'm truthful and people will be like, ah, blowing whistles at home, being like, no, you know how uh -huh. to, you just screwed up there. And sometimes it might be a mistake. Hmm. I might make a genuine mistake and they might come at me and I'll be like, all right, everybody, calm, simmer down. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that's where that... <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, that's where it comes down from because everybody's so on edge. It's like, all right, simmer down. Mm -hmm. What happened? And even the guy says I'm repulsive. With the per I'll be like, all right, simmer down. Mm -hmm. What is repulsive about me? Right. And like, it's like, breaking people into reality instead of reaction right well because it, everybody wants to make a strong statement and it was funny because everybody in the audience it. wanted to talk because mm -hmm. they want the safe space that i'm creating it's another interesting thing i think there were a lot of people who are trying to be uh positive in their work i just saw david burns american utopia last oh, night yeah. he addressed that the idea of change and <clears throat> the fact that everybody probably needs to, to change and he's he's actually got a, a, a let's see if I got the the card from it I brought it to show you I didn't necessarily plan to show you they've got this uh, reasons to be cheerful nonprofit online editorial project that is a tonic for tumultuous times so they're trying to help people be positive and still change the rough part of that I, I think um, so if you really want somebody to change and you're calling them out on something that they're doing wrong what happens when they do change what happens if they do see that what they've that what they've done is, is wrong how do you hold them responsible for that and still accept a, a positive change if it happens do you know what I'm saying? Because well, you're I think to you're, hold somebody responsible But that's for the only if you do that through shame. Nobody mm -hmm. grows through shame. So you can't shame people. Mm -hmm. It's more awareness. That, I'm not trying to tell people they're wrong. That's how people are interpreting it. Because that's from our child. That's mm -hmm. our kids in us. We don't want to be wrong. We're scared. We're afraid somebody's going to take advantage. We're afraid somebody's going to tell mm -hmm. me I'm crazy. We're afraid I'm, a, I'm scared. I, don't, I have a voice. I, ah, that's what's going on with people. Mm -hmm. And I have so much compassion and empathy to that that I'm like, and for my own self. Like, I know mm -hmm. that where I'm coming from is my experience. Mm -hmm. Well, but, but take somebody like Justin Trudeau. Yeah. Who, who it seems as though there are more and more blackface pictures yes. coming out uh, daily now with him. Do you believe, or should we believe, that he can change, and should we believe him when he says he has? No. Because mm -hmm. that's where the empaths get in trouble. We okay. go in la-la land, and we go, okay, great, he's changed, great, la-la-la, and then we're like, why are we still so miserable? Uh, no. <laughs> the, 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 the positivity comes from the ability to walk through your own mm -hmm. self-imposed limits. Mm -hmm. So the self-imposed limits could be that you buy... You say, oh, yeah, he changed. Or you just go in your corner and go, he's full of shit. I, there's nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. Those are self-imposed limits. What Justin, how do you say his last name? Trudeau. Trudeau needs to do mm. is sit down and talk to somebody and have a very, very uncomfortable conversation about what his behavior was like and why he, how he built his career on saying that he's trying to help the racism in Canada right. and what, what really is going on here. Because he doesn't even know himself. But what are we to make of it if he comes through that conversation and says he changed? He we don't changed. know what we make of it until we see it. There's a universal right. truth that you will believe if he did or not, because he will show you through changing show, is shown through behavior. Like somebody said one time, I keep I keep reverting to my old behavior. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, if you're currently exhibiting old behavior, it's called current behavior. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So we all lie to ourselves. That's the other thing, too. We all lie to ourselves because we're so terrified to find out that we might be awful. Mm -hmm. But underneath awful is awesome. Mm -hmm. And yeah. awful can be sometimes the behavior. It might not be who we are internally. Do you believe that, that underneath awful there is always awesome somewhere? Or some people are just unsavable? I don't change? know, but people ask me that question all the time. 
because it's it's sort of the ultimate. Well, for, for for somebody who is is dedicating themselves for positivity, it's it's sort of the ultimate question, isn't it? That who is dedicating themselves to positivity? Are you? De- or, or I'm dedicating myself to reality. To reality, which is very positive. It's much more. Reality is a much better place to live than in the drama, mm. in the fear. So, but the the drama and fear is what everybody seems to be seems to have accepted right now. Well, it's because nobody knows how to get out of it. Mm. We're just spinning, 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 spinning. And what I want to do is at least try with my work. What I mean, what else am I doing? Mm-hmm. To be uh, like a guinea pig and be like, okay, let's see. The, the positivity, you reach positivity by saying no. By being in reality with, the, with that things are really ugly. That's how I opened the talk show. Mm-hmm. Yes, but, some mm-hmm. things are ugly. Mm-hmm. And nobody wants to hear it. Mm-hmm. But it gets uglier the less we the more we don't pay attention to it. And I'm telling you, I said this on Artie's podcast. I have been saying this for 30 years and people have been screaming at me and calling me a cunt and you name it. And I'm like, this is bizarre. Why are they calling me a cunt? Wait, to, like they're I, calling you that for saying They that, asked that. me how I thought things were going to get better in the world. This was six, five years ago. <laughs> I used to, I've had this conversation, a similar conversation, not this conversation, Wilco has that song, Every Generation Thinks It's the End of the World. And, you you know, they go, are, we, are we overreacting to things? And I used to think, well, you know, read Candide. Things weren't great back in Voltaire's age either. Right. You know, thing, people have always been, this is not a, a new feeling for us. But there's that creeping feeling, well, what if it actually is worse <laughs> now? And well, what's worse about it is that we broke into, we've all broken that the fantasy is broken. That's why it feels worse. Mm-hmm. We don't. Everybody's like, "Oh, I want to get back to my old life." It's not here. It's gone. It was mm-hmm. never was real. Mm-hmm. The credit card debt, the two houses, the car, getting the bigger house, doing thinking that money was going to solve everything. That's why people are so mad. They were sold a bill of goods, mm-hmm. and they and people don't want to admit that they might have been wrong mm-hmm. because we're so terrified to do that. Because we're afraid we're going to be attacked. But I'm like, well, so what? Okay, so I'm repulsive. What? We'll be ding dong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. Like, let's really just what? Mm-hmm. So what does it mean? Where does the, the show go for, from here? The talk show. Yeah. Well, I'm waiting to find out. It's on Compound Media, which is funny because that's like a real male-dominated. So all my work has been like I've been trying to transcend this male power thing and mm-hmm. I have to go through all the powerful men to get to do it it's such a fascinating thing that's gone the whole story is fat it's like I'm live action even with the CBS thing it's like uh, people have said to me so you've sw- you swam through the teeth of the sharks uh-huh. and the funniest part of the story is because they underestimated me because of my accent because of the the accent specifically yes. the, the the men that you've talked to and because of the way this. I look. Mm-hmm. No, not them. I'm talking about like CBS. They totally oh, they, okay. never thought I was going to. They never thought I was as smart. Never. Mm-hmm. But the people at Compound are, are different in some respect. I think Anthony is very smart mm-hmm. from a business standpoint. Mm-hmm. And he's sick of it. He wants a new. He's sick of what's going on in the country, too. So he's like, that's what I say. Like, never in a million years would I be on Anthony's, con- Opie and Anthony's network. Never. Mm-hmm. We're in a new world now. Things are good. <laughs> <laughs> it feels awful, but this is what change feels like. This mm-hmm. is what people don't want to go through in a personal level. I do have uh, well, one comic friend who talks about how, talks about the whole political correctness thing that, that people are saying, you know, the comics who complain about being political correct, politically correct. And I, I don't want to name who he is because I don't know if he wants me to, this wasn't said in public, but like, oh, I know why you're mad. You, you don't know what you can what racist thing you can say that the room will accept anymore you don't know what sexist thing you could say you don't feel safe saying that stuff anymore so now it's pc culture that's what their their reaction is but that might even be the case too for those individuals so it's like okay so let's talk like okay so i would like to have that conversation and be like okay so what is it Mm -hmm. and we did start having it on my show Mm -hmm. like the comics were like we don't go out to be mean Mm -hmm. But no comic ever says that, but then sometimes the stuff... But then they're mean. mean, but of course they yeah. are. What happens in your family? I mean, it's all baloney. I'm so sick of it. It's like, what happens in your family? <laughs> How many Thanksgiving dinners are like... <laughs> people saying perverted stuff, and there's fist fights, and people get drunk, and it's like, I want to... That's what I... I want to bring the refreshingness of the... Almost of like... 
that's what human is, what we've been taught to pretend, and mm. the social media is making it worse. That, that we can talk about all of this and get to a point if we're both honest about Breathe it. a little bit more and, be, and show, like, that. so what if I'm repulsive? <laughs> I'll be the one that's repulsive. I'll do it first. Uh-huh. What happens to me if I'm repul- What? Let's see what happens. Like, it's like I'm... Everybody, I feel like everybody just keeps looking at me and they're like, how did Sue get out? Mm-hmm. How did Sue get out? <laughs> How did Sue get out of the cage? I'm like, I just walked out. Mm-hmm. That's what I feel like I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I feel like I finally, I've always been the person. I'm like, I'll do it. Mm-hmm. Let me see. Everybody's terrified that people are going to judge them. They're going to say they're ugly. They're going to say they're repulsive. They're going to say nobody loves them. They're going to say this. I'm like, all right, let me see. What happens if I do that? Mm-hmm. I have, <laughs> I have a, an incredibly nerdy comic book parallel I could make there that I should probably not Why? make. Why? Because it's... No, uh, I, uh, probably nobody wants to hear me uh, inject the. Uh, but even and, thinking and, the way you're thinking like that. Swamp thing into, but you just <laughs> this. judge uh, that mm. instead yeah, well, of naturally went along with it. Because I'm sure there's a lot of nerdy people that are listening that <laughs> would love it and love the connection that, that what I'm talking mm. about is that's what's going to happen. Mm. I feel like if I can hold it together, mm. which I'm going to be able to, I, what I went through with TV, there's nothing going to shake me now. I'm going to be able to through my personal story connect the dots for everybody so the nerds are going to be like oh mm-hmm. yes that's my comic book and oh and that's this and that's where this is that and that mm-hmm. and and so instead of me being somebody who's responsible for everybody i'm going to light everybody up with my light that's what's going to happen mm-hmm. well the, the, i'll try to make this as uh, the comparison as quick as possible because i've talked about it on here before and I, I tend to go off on it it was an episode of swamp thing where all of the occult heroes from the dc universe wound up confronting pure evil yes which is darkness and they all and they're trying to stop this wave of pure evil from destroying the universe and they all go in and evil asks them questions about evil and why is there evil and they all have answers you know the specter is one of my favorite uh, he's uh, heroes and he's his power is he's the living embodiment of god's vengeance on earth which is a little heavier than I got shot in a rocket to this planet and the the sun gives me strength. But, you know, he got chewed up and spat out because he was he wanted to destroy pure evil. Swamp Thing's the only one that survives this because he doesn't know. He doesn't have an answer. Hey, evil asks why is there evil? He says he doesn't know why is there good. I don't know and he walks out. He's the only one who survives that that question. And that you might see now why maybe I was I, I wanted I didn't want to necessarily claw into this, but I do see a parallel in the sort of Socratic method that you're using in this uh, in the show uh, to question these sorts of things. Which is so funny that you say the Socratic method because that's a line from my sitcom in my script mm-hmm. because I kept saying about Costello that they didn't know how to write for smart, uneducated people. Mm-hmm. They didn't even know those two words could go to... A lot of people don't think those words can go together. Mm-hmm. And so the Socratic method, we weren't... I wasn't necessarily... I went to UMass for two or three years for a theater, but I wasn't taught mm-hmm. the Socratic method. I wasn't taught... But I still have tremendous mm-hmm. critical thinking, especially mm-hmm. for my street smarts. And, and you were saying smart, uneducated, not smart, and educated. Smart, mm-hmm. smart uneducated people. Mm-hmm. Which is... Most it's of the world. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the world, yes. It's and not so something they, that's presented frequently other than no. goodwill hunting. Maybe. No, but we are very, I mean, and all my blue-collar guys are the ones that helped me through the CBS thing. They mm-hmm. all helped me. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. So now my perspective is like, wait a minute. And a lot of the guys, a lot of my guy friends that were voted for Trump, first of all, mm-hmm. they, they're struggling now with admitting that maybe they might have wished that they didn't vote for him. That's mm-hmm. one thing that's happened. But also I keep saying it to them, why have you abandoned your critical thinking to this man? Mm-hmm. And that's striking them so much and this whole idea of being smart and uneducated and the fact that these suits, these, they, they, they take advantage of the, the uh, working class with this promise, this promise of the money, this promise of this something. Any system that, that, that you create, any political or social system, uh, perhaps I should say philosophy instead of system, seems to be a way to abdicate thinking in a way. If you're, if you're a Republican, you believe all of these things 
good. I don't have to think about that anymore. If you're Democrat, I believe all these things. I don't have to think about that uh, anymore. If you're Catholic, I believe all of these things. I don't have to think about that anymore. This is what I believe. But that's how they exploit us. That's exactly how they exploit us. That is it. You just said to me that somebody said, why would Lauren Michaels put that guy on and not vet him? Mm -hmm. Vet him. Pay more attention to those thoughts. Mm -hmm. Our logical uneducated, untrained, because even think about schools. Schools were made so that we could get ready to go to the workforce. Mm -hmm. I mean, give me a break. (laughs) It's like, that's not the answer either. All Mm -hmm. of it's the answer. And talking to one another and living in community, and we'll get isolated. If we live in community and we have a conversation, Mm -hmm. we're going to learn, and we're going to find out that we're a lot more alike than we we are different. Mm -hmm. That is the big thing. So we've gotten to an hour and 15 minutes, and I have looked at my questions, I think, three times. (laughs) So... And I think we could probably keep talking for a very long time. But no one will listen that stuff. long, will they? I don't know. I've, I've they might, though. Too. I never knew they I might. turned into this, like, I don't know, freedom fighter or something. I don't know what it is, but I'm definitely, it's definitely what I'm walking into. Mm-hmm. Well, so what do you think you can change, as a, both as a, an individual well, as an individual, as a comic, and, and with, with this show. Well, I already have changed a lot. Mm-hmm. I had a, a network sign an NDA. Mm-hmm. I negotiated my own TV deal with unprecedented side letter. That, and then the WGA just fired the agency. So I'm like, yeah, well, you fired them. I already did it. You already made a, you made a contract with me without the agent, so we know it's possible. Mm-hmm. The network and Sue Costello made a contract together. Mm-hmm. People can't wrap their brains around the fact that a smart, uneducated woman beat a network. So it's just taken them a little while. The more I tell the story, the more it's going to come out, the more people are going to get it. It's going to come out, the story. Mm -hmm. I changed the dynamic of how Hollywood does business. Mm -hmm. They thought they were going to use me, and I got in there and changed the way business gets done. Mm -hmm. That's going to come out. Mm -hmm. So I already did that. My talk show, people are losing their minds over it they love it they're like texting me when is it what is there is there another episode on today Mm -hmm. is there another episode on today then my sitcom my play it's all the same basis the same basis is to let up a little of our ugly so that we can heal Mm -hmm. and stop pushing it down and pretending that none of us have it and that's the that's the roadmap for most of us you would think or that's something that that and any any individual listening to this could take that sort of idea that it's okay if maybe you were creepy sometime like <laughs> you have to admit it so you don't do it again that's what mm-hmm. how the unconscious works if you don't admit it you continue the the compulsion mm-hmm. So we have to bring it up to the con- we have to bring the behavior to the conscious so that people can see what they're doing so that mm-hmm. not so that they can be wrong so that they can adjust it so they can stop being Hating themselves, too. That's the other reason why somebody hurt. Nobody who loves themselves hurts people. Mm-hmm. They don't. And then, well, that, that feeds into, I'm going to start another tangent. <laughs> God, I know. Away. It brings up everybody's brains. They're like, but what about this? But what about that? But what about this? But what about that? And well, the, the idea of loving yourself and the, uh, the idea of, because that, that's a complicated uh that's a complicated thing as well because we were talking on the, as we were walking in here about the the idea of boasting about yourself or or bragging about yourself yeah what does that mean I, it, it's interesting because people do have a reaction to if you say you did a good job mm. but it's only because they've been told they can't do it and so you have to kind of bust through that level that's what I'm trying to do I'm trying to bust through that level mm-hmm I'm already busting through it. At what point is allowing yourself to be positive about yourself? When does that... I'm so proud of myself. I'm does, so does, proud of myself. When does that tip over fra, from being healthy to arrogance? You can feel it in your body. Mm-hmm. A physical reaction? To, yes. To, to there the, is a universal truth. Mm-hmm. If I was being arrogant right now, people would be like, she's repulsive. <laughs> which brings us back to the because some of those people I understand one guy said on WTF he said she makes me nauseous and I'm attracted to her at the same time and that is literally because sometimes I speak the truth so it makes people uncomfortable mm-hmm. and that's where the nausea comes from mm-hmm. but I don't even you don't see me getting defensive about that no I love people mm-hmm. and if I was making somebody nauseous I would not try to make them more nauseous mm-hmm. 
I would say, okay, I'll go away for a second. It's this fine line that we need to learn how to like respect each other. Don't, I don't have to be smaller because you're bigger and you don't have to be smaller because I'm bigger. That's what we mm. keep doing to each other instead of being like meeting each other where we are. But it's tough for some reason. I don't know why. Because nobody's showing anybody. Mm -hmm. Who do we know who does that? Because nobody wants to, to reveal themselves in a way that... And I'm ready to. Because mm. I know that I love people. So I'm like, I can do it because I love people. Mm. So, so how can I go wrong? Where can people find out what's going on? Suka on my website. I'm at Florian. Oh, well, you're not, this is going to drop later, so they won't be able to come to Florian. But uh, my website, SueCostello.com. On Twitter, at SueCostello. On Instagram, I am SueCostello. The cool thing is my career now, looking back, everybody's going to, it's all coming together. They're like, Sue really did care about people. Mm -hmm. And I understand. People have such distrust. They don't trust because there's not a lot. And now I had to let it go that long. And now people are like, oh. And even Rose McGowan was like, Sue helped me. Mm. back then and then everybody was like this is what's happening with my work it's like three dimensional now it's probably going to go four dimensional mm. I Rose says that to me I put up the clip of Selty and then everybody starts going Rose you were so young mm. and then everybody's like and I'm like yeah because they only see now mm. they forget and then they're like oh Rose was a young girl when that happened to her Like, and then they start having more compassion so it's like the work is just going to it's going to light everybody up because people mm. want it. Mm. People want to be better people. People want to have connection. They want to, they, I don't think they want to sit at home and watch Twitter and hear disgusting, horrible things inundated every day on them. I don't think, that's not naive of me. No, I, I think there's a little part of people that, that rubberneck sometimes. But, but that's, that's also uh, because that's all that's being fed to them. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, there's, there's so much out there. You just got to, but a lot of it is negative. It. A lot of it is, but there, there's... Because it's ricocheting. And that's what I want to start seeing if we can stop and not ricochet. Just one second. Just don't ricochet. And I do pe hear people say sometimes... It's been a while since I've heard it, to be honest. But, but there is a... People would say to me... Or not say to me, just say... On a, uh, on a Facebook post or in a conversation, you know... There's no good music anymore. There's no good comedy anymore. They don't make movies the way they used to make movies. I think, well, you're you're not looking for it. It's not being shoveled to you like maybe it was at one point because maybe your tastes have changed and what you loved in in 1985 isn't what's the main thing anymore. But, but see, I would listen to that person. But I would listen to that person. Mm -hmm. But there's stuff out there. That's what I want to say. There, there's but stuff no, that you love. No, but then you say that to them and then you're not listening to them. That's your point of view. What you would do with that person is go, why do you feel that way? Well, I've... And I then they wake up. Talk about, I hear people who, who like a particular kind of thing. It happens with rock music all the time. But I say, well, the people will say there's not... They're not making good rock music anymore. They're like, well, have you heard the Drive By Truckers do album? You know, no, I would. But that? see, you're not listening. You have to say, why do you feel that way to them? Because otherwise, they're just going to get into a fight with you. Mm -hmm. If you say, well, ha -da -da -da, here's a here's an answer, here's an answer, instead of going, well, why do you think there's no music out there? Mm -hmm. Then they wake up and they go, yeah, what am I saying? What do I really believe that? It's mm -hmm. just a one little move in between is all I want to do. Just one little. Mm -hmm. Listening. I keep saying I'm bringing back listening. Bell bottoms uh -huh. go in and out. I'm bringing back listening. Uh -huh. So instead of me reacting, I'm just somebody says to me, Sue, you know, I really don't think you're funny. I'll be like, well, what is it? What do you think is not funny? What is it about it? Mm -hmm. And to be able to have tolerance, like love and tolerance like that for other human beings. Do people generally react well to that when they you say that? They love it. It's the most amazing thing to watch somebody breathe and go, they never heard. Mm -hmm. nobody listens to anybody and they're like even if it's a contentious conversation they walk away and they're like that was I feel good because mm -hmm. they're being heard well, well thank you for being on thank you this for having me, me for talking I to love me for people. an hour and a half I appreciate I that I really do go ahead watch me watch me watch me watch me see if I love people uh -huh. see if I didn't put on a show for Pine Street Inn when I was in the 6th grade see if I don't love people mm -hmm. I love humanity 
Thanks again to Sue Costello for sitting down to speak with me on her recent trip back to Boston. You can keep up to date on news from her at www.suecostello.com and find her on Twitter and Facebook under Sue Costello and Instagram under I am Sue Costello. She's also filming a new movie called Mo, which you can find on the social medias at at Mo Movie. If you liked this or any other episode of the Department of Tangents podcast, please consider subscribing and or leaving us a positive review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Radio Public, Stitcher, or wherever you get your fine podcasts. You can also find us on Spotify and YouTube and find reviews, essays, short films, and other stuff on the blog under www.departmentoftangents.com. Speaking of which, the Daily Horror Film Fest is going on now over at the blog, a different short horror film for every day through October. I'll be posting new shorts and a classic or two longer ones on the weekend, so check that out on www.departmentoftangents.com. Our featured track this week is Living Rock from Rebecca Turner from her upcoming album, The New Wrong Way, out November 6th. This will be Turner's third album and her first since 2009's Slowpoke. Since then, she has continued to write and play, but family and work concerns kept her from finishing a new album. The New Wrong Way is a culmination of 10 years of writing and tweaking the songs, which were recorded starting last winter. This is the opening song from the album, a riffy roots rock tune called Living Rock. You can find out more about her at RebeccaTurner.net. This is Rebecca Turner. <laughs> 